Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, it sure is time. Okay. So um yeah, I know it's I know it's a big data dump for all of you. Um let me just uh, close this down. Um, so it's a totally different sort of flavor in a way. Um, so it's really strange, you know, I guess this always happens, you know, so because I was thinking about this for a long time, starting in January, um, I've been sort of trying to think about how to present all this stuff to real newcomers, you know, so no, so no Markov stuff, keep things simple, sine waves instead of noise. And instead of trying to prepare this, I had a really cool discovery in the last six weeks. So this wasn't supposed to be a research seminar. This is supposed to be a tutorial. Um, so that's why you'll see an emergency exit sign. If, if I'm going too far, I'll just skip some slides and I won't give the details. But there's something in here I'm super excited about. Um, and then I'm gonna give more applications. So the first hour is gonna be sort of some, some general theory um, with with applications at all, and the second one will be more applications and history oriented, and and a full history of actor critics, six, 1968. Okay, um, so first of all, you know I, I've been talking about stochastic approximation. I want to define it. I'll do that in one slide. Uh, I want to explain to you what I mean by quasi stochastic approximation. I've already said it. I'm replacing noise by by quasi random numbers like sine waves. Um, and I've learned over the last four months that the area of quasi Monte Carlo is so damned hard. <laughs> it is so deep and so difficult. I'm not going to touch that theory. I'll talk about sine waves just to make it easy. And I'm going to explain how you apply this to gradient free optimization and just so I'll be getting closer to actor critic methods. All right. And I'll show some examples. And then this is the thing I'm really excited about. But I think it may be too much. So Aditya says, Sean, it's too much. We'll see. <laughs> okay. I'll give you the result. I might not give you the proof. All right. So um, a lot of, I mean, so the paper I mentioned with Prashant on um, LP methods for Q learning, um, that goes back, you know, quite a ways. When I was at uh, NRL two years ago, uh, I got a big, I just some fantastic interaction with people there, you know, including um, Andre, who you'll hear from at the end of today, Marcello, who's went back to ETH, who's at ETH, and Emiliano, who's at Boulder, Colorado. And I'm sorry for the crappy photograph. Uh, that's UHN during his graduation several years ago. He's at NREL now. And that's Huang Chen, who's uh, in the math department here. He'll be graduating, by the way. This guy is awesome. They'll be graduating uh, next year, so uh, keep your eyes open. Um, so stochastic approximation, my caricature is this: you, you know, throw in a bunch of noise in stochastic, in Q, in reinforcement learning, it's often excitation um, or exploration, uh, and you get some estimates of some parameter theta n, which determines your Q function, your policy, or something like that, and this is going back to Eric's comment that asymptotic statistics are useful. Um, you know, basically Aditya's thesis, a lot of it was about um, using the central limit theorem, which is an asymptotic concept, the stochastic approximation for algorithm design. And it was very successful for the algorithms he was looking at. It's not, doesn't always work, but it did in his case. All right, so the goal is that we've talked about Every single problem we've talked about is a root finding problem. You know, we want to find a solution f bar of theta star equals zero, where the uh, f bar is a function of a parameter theta and something random that comes from nature or our own exploration signals or whatever. So that's what stochastic approximation is. And, and just like Eric, I have a million different symbols for the same thing. I've theta, I've got a little squiggly theta, I've got a big theta, I've got so many thetas, it's insane. Um, it's just, there aren't enough symbols in the world. Um, but so, this is what I mean, Chaba, about it being backwards. Why did Robinson Monroe present an algorithm? And then, I don't know, that make it clear that the entire algorithm was this. 
the whole algorithm was we would like an OD to, to, to um, solve this root finding problem, right? Maybe we've designed the root finding problem so this OD is stable, and then let's use an Euler scheme to approximate that. I, I'm so more talking about pedagogy. I don't know why it's always flipped around. We present an algorithm and then we analyze it. So often the OD comes first. Um, but it's not just pedagogy, you'll see. Um, so again, you would do an Euler approximation if you could, right? It involves an expectation that's too complex. And so what you do is you replace the F bar, you know, which is too complex to compute, with the observations, right? That's the, that's the definition of a stochastic approximation. And, and basically the idea is you can write this down as exactly this, but with noise. And so all of the convergence there of stochastic approximation is to say that, um, oh, I should have waited, that Euler approximations are robust. <laughs> That's convergence there of stochastic approximation. And it is robust, and it takes a bit of muscle to prove that robustness, but that's it. That's what stochastic approximation is. So I don't know why it's made out to be so mysterious. Um, it's really funny, and I think that uh, it's a disservice because it's a very beautiful and powerful technique, and it's a shame that it intimidates people so much. But that's it. You have an OD you'd like to approximate. You can't do Euler, so you basically would do a noisy Euler approximation. Um, and the thing is that Euler approximations are robust, and the mathematical tools you use to prove that are the same you use to prove that this is convergent. The theory is identical. identical <laughs> you know well, i know that i know there's a bit of martingale stuff in there but there's that's just properties of the disturbance <laughs> you know you know there's bellman Grodwell. there's you know how much noise is there and bellman Grodwell done here the noise is because you're discretizing an ode uh, is there a more precise way of saying that these are identical or the, uh, the theory oh, for the, these? The theory is that bellman Gronwell is the key step. Okay. Yeah, Dilemma. so um, so basically um, to prove existence to the ODE, bellman Gronwell. you know, um, to prove that this thing approximates this thing, bellman Gronwell. And the, here, dealing with the noise, you get an error term, bellman Gronwell. So, you know, and so that's why if you look at Vivek Borkar's book, he knocks off convergence just in a, you know, very quickly in a paragraph, you know, one subsection and then moves on. <laughs> so the convergence theory is not deep. It just took a lot of brilliant people to come up with the right way of setting up the problem for analysis. And now that it's so well done, it's really easy to understand convergence theory. Now, rates of convergence theory is still deep and difficult. Um, and when, when this function is nasty, if it's not Lipschitz or something, then that, that's when you get huge literature, like work of Ben Aim and stuff. Uh, you can see references in the, uh, in the, at the end. Okay, now that's convergence theory. Um, um, so you can see C of X monograph. Um, now, um, oh yeah, I didn't, I, I thought it was a slide, but, but again, rates of convergence, variance, all that stuff, that's when the statistics really comes in. And then things really get harder. Now, um, now let me let me you know let me work towards it closer to convince you that this is how the OD method should be defined. Is that first you design the dynamics so that theta t converges to the desired theta star. You have to decide what your theta star should be, your metric should be, and so therefore, this converges, convergence holds as well. So this is a control problem, right? It's regulation. You know, we're trying to make theta t, the state variable, converge to a 
a desired equilibrium, theta star. It's a control problem, but there's no physics. We are unbound by nature, any kind of laws. We can do whatever we want. So for example, here's something crazy. Let's forget about thinking of theta t as a variable. You know, why not think of f bar of theta t as a variable? You know, this would say that uh, f bar of theta t is just equal to f bar of theta zero times e to the minus t. Happy face, right? Yeah. We can do whatever we want. Now, this is going to end up being complex because when you do the chain rule, you get a matrix gain algorithm. But that's one way now we know how you derive zap to learning. And it's called the newton raphson flow now. That's, that's what I mean. Smale, this is from Smale, uh, Smale back in the 70s. Well, I, I'm just trying to get at we have so much freedom in designing the ODE. And then we have to talk to a numerical analyst, perhaps, to find out the most efficient way to approximate it. And they might they might suggest some Runga Kuta method instead of the Lagrange. All right. All right. So this is one example where the ODE design, you'd never find this in a discrete world. You'd only find it by thinking of ODEs. Okay, so I'm pulling you a little to my side. Now, I, of course, I'm not saying it's the only way to do things, but I, I'm saying that that uh, this is an example where the ODE gives you great insight in how to design an algorithm. You know, and the translation is there, hard. Yeah, so, yeah, so in this problem definition, uh, what is hidden is that very often you have constraints on what you're observing. So it's, it's true that you want to control theta in some way, and then there are some constraints on what you are observing, and then you have to cook with that. And yes. somehow apply things such that you get on one hand stability, and on the other hand, you're only working with things that you can observe. So the way you're writing, these two things match up. But if I'm thinking about just TD learning or, or something like that, there are a million ways of constructing these things, and uh, you know you can change uh, various things. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, if your objective. If you've identified an objective, which is f bar of theta star equals zero, right? You, you know, if that's your goal, right, then you have a control problem. And you and to solve that control problem, you know, you want to you want to design a stable ODE. You know, as I said, that's a control problem. Um, that's what I mean. So if you if you've been given a goal written as an expectation. You know, then you want to think really hard about ODE design. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I'm just making the note that yeah. uh, there is some observer um, yeah. process also going on here. Oh, absolutely, uh, but that's what I, that's why I highlighted this. I mean, right there. Yeah. You know? Right. We're assuming that we well, assuming that we have so simple that you observe that. Observe. Yeah, but yeah. sometimes it's not so simple. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. Yeah. Oh no, I'm not. I'm not saying this is the only way to think about things. Please, please, please. I, you know, I'm. I'm kind of object. I just think that Lenny Zung made a big mistake way back when. I think it would be much prettier teaching this to, to spend a lot more time on ODEs, understand the stability properties, and then say, hey, there's numerical methods to approximate, and hey, there's even numerical methods when you don't observe the uh, functions. It's just pedag. I'm thinking more pedagogy than anything. Um, yeah. Uh, putting up a theorist hat, uh, the natural question to ask is whether if you're thinking in terms of designs that can come out from this, is this going to be limited in some way? I, are we ruling out uh, any discrete time algorithms? Yeah, absolutely. We're, absolutely. Uh, so we're, we're all the, the, um, the batch algorithms I talked about in lecture two, you know, no way. You know, it's just... Uh, all the, then you have to go backwards. You know, you, you design the linear program and then you can prove convergence through an ODE. That's a case where Lenny Leung is absolutely right. You know, and I then, have to start with that algorithm. Yeah, yeah. The, the question is whether we're losing anything uh, in yeah. terms well, of- Well, there's an example where we are. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, there, yeah. Yes, there are examples where we are, where, you, where this is, is, not, is too restrictive. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, so I'm, I'm not, to, that's what I mean, it's not the only way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
But again, but let me just say it again to everybody. You would, you would never get the, my previous talk from OD methods. You really need uh, to think discrete and then, and then, and then use the OD methods it's usually defined uh, for stability. Okay, um, now the, uh, the next thing is you can start looking at gain selection and, and there's some really pretty theory there. So if you take a gain, which is a step size, which is some constant times uh, n plus one, then you can get this optimal one over n convergence rate for the mean square error but only if this matrix is Hurwitz, where A star is a linearization, assuming it's, it's smooth uh, at the equilibrium, um, which is a sad fact, that's a sad phase. So you need, you need G big enough. Yeah. Just for clarification, Hurwitz means that eigenvalues oh, yeah. lie in the left open plane. Well, thank you. Some people sometimes flip these things, <laughs> but I know. Yeah. Sorry. So uh, yeah. So I, I mean, yeah, it means all the eigenvalues are over here in the left half plane. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I forgot. I forgot to mention that. So the um, yeah. Um, yeah. So the basically the linearization is asymptotically stable uh, um, at the at the. At the and so that that's a sad fact, you know. And so, and the the zap things I mentioned was a way to deal with that, and to get optimal convergence rate. I mean, to optimize the constant. Okay. And when that happens, you actually have a formula. And again, I don't I don't want to keep on harking back to um, to Eric, but I just it's nice to get somebody else to say it. Asymptotic statistics can be valuable. Um, and I'm not gonna, I don't have time to show you plots, but the CLT is sometimes very, very rapid to converge. And so you can get real insight on um, rates of convergence in the asymptotic statistics. And isn't it amazing that only linearizations are enough to tell you about the uh, optimal rate of convergence? You don't need to know the covariance of the noise to know if the rate of convergence is optimal. You know, it's all about sort of, you know, very, very, uh, um, you know, really simple concepts. Um, so it's so I, I I love this stuff, but I can I can give you examples not today, but where it, it does fail, where the CLT is worthless. I can I can give examples, numerical examples. All right, so there it is. You know everything about stochastic approximation. I mean, I just wanted to explain what it is, and there's a nice theory. Now I want to do the whole thing over again with sine waves instead of noise. All right, and you see, I've got these pretty sine waves, you know, and now I've got my estimates going along in this beautiful, smooth way. Well, I claim this is reality in all the examples I've looked at. It's it's so pretty how using the smooth exploration, how, how how cool it looks. But I haven't looked at high dimensional problems yet. So, all right, so all right, you ready for your crash course? Questions? All right. Um, so in a lot of applications, we create the noise. Now I know that's not universal, not finance, <laughs> but in, a, in many applications, the volatility is not the biggest issue. There's, there's randomness and uncertainty. Um, and there's, you know, there's, there's randomness, but it's complexity and uncertainty about the model, things like that, that drive everything. And we definitely create the, I think most of you would agree in the numerical work you've done, the us creating the noise is the biggest source of noise. When Google spent 47 days training their computer to play chess, they inserted the noise. The chess wasn't being noisy. <laughs> okay. Um, so if we're inserting the noise, then we might as well make it tame. We might, might as well make it nice. Okay. Um, and why settle for this crappy rate of convergence? We're getting this lousy rate of convergence because we're introducing this, this blah noise, let's stop. <laughs> it's a terrible rate of convergence. So what we want is to get that rate of convergence. Instead of one over n, we want one over n squared. And maybe we want to optimize the constant as well. 
and do it purely deterministically. So there's an expectation there, which I'll explain. There's still expectations. Um, and then go through this three-step design process. So basically, I want to design an OD based on my goal, as I said before, um, that I'm going to, you know, come up with something based on exploration. Um, and then I'm going to use something like Euler or, or some other better approximation to go from the ODE to this. Trying to preserve, so I'm going to get really tight, beautiful results on the rate of convergence of this result. So that's brand new. That's a month old. Um, and then I need a numerical analyst to tell me how to, the best way to preserve that rate. Rather than repro reproduce the theory here, I think I can just be very clever in my numerical approximation and how to sample this to get to preserve my rate of convergence. All right, that's a conjecture. You know, so I'll, I'll write that down. That's a conjecture. The conjecture is, can I preserve rates? Is that called, that's what, I mean, my conjecture is that we can preserve the rates. Um, that's an open question. All right, ready? Okay, so, um, all right, everybody, Drink your cappuccino, your espresso. You know, um, I've got to I've got to do some technicalities, put in some technicalities. So, an example of a of this quasi noise is just sinusoids, but it's much easier to work with complex exponentials. Okay, so I've got a bunch a vector of complex exponentials of of different frequencies. Okay, and that's just an example of where I get this crucial property that I need for rates of convergence. That if I take this noise and I do look at partial integrals, they're bounded because they're also just sine waves. Okay. Now we're going to see that that's a very general property for dynamical systems, as I'll explain. So what I'm going to do is to generalize these um, these complex exponentials. I'm going to assume my noise comes out of a dynamical system like this. Um, because this includes all sorts of other things like uh, sawtooth functions and stuff like that, um, um, which I can make into a continuous domain. So I've got a domain that the probing, call it a probing signal lives on, uh, which is compact. And I've got this vector field H, which defines C. But if you like, just ignore that and just say, I'm, I'm looking at sine waves, you know, all right? So if you like the whole lecture, I'm just talking about mixed use of sine waves um, and cosine waves, because that's all I'm doing is encoding cosines and sine waves. So wait, so is is H an operator here? Oh no, no, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a function. Yeah, yeah, it's just a function. Yeah, yeah, because you take the derivative of okay, sure. Yeah. Okay, but the point is that this is a this is a mark this is a Markov process. I know I know it's not what you'd normally call a Markov process. Uh, but it's really important to keep in mind that it is Markov because Poisson's equation plays a major role, which is a, um, which is something that has followed me around my whole life. And it comes up in actual critic methods. It comes up everywhere. I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment. Um, uh, but the mindset of saying, hey, that's a Markov process is really valuable in thinking about how to analyze these algorithms. Okay, so um, there's a notion of ergodicity. Um, we're gonna assume that there's a unique invariant measure. I apologize again, denoted pi. I'm sorry, I'm torturing you, but pi for me is an invariant measure. And I'm gonna assume that the sample path averages converge to a, an ergodic average for every, um, say, bounded continuous function and, and every initial condition. Okay, so this is obviously true for this, Right, where the limiting measure would be product form, it'd be a, you know, independent marginals uniform on the unit circle in the complex plane. All right, so that's my key assumption, and again, just assume that if you if you if you want. Um, oh yeah, Poisson's equation. So this is the definition of Poisson's equation. Um, it, you'd have a conditional expectation if this was a stochastic setting, 
But because it's deterministic, there's no conditional expectation. So this is the definition of Poisson's equation, where G is called the forcing function. And again, I spent half of my life being chased around by Poisson's equation. It's like a um, terminal disease. I caught it in 1990, and I will die with it. It just it chases me everywhere I go. Who would think Poisson's equation would come up in getting convergence rates for deterministic algorithms? Well, it does. Um, so this is crucial. And you can see and the reason it's crucial is that very often this has a very nicely behaved solution. And you can see if it does have a solution, I have an ergodic theorem and a rate of convergence in the ergodic theorem. Because I can divide both sides by T1 minus T0. Do I have it here? Yeah. I'm just saying here that I can divide both sides by T. You know, 1 over T, integral 0 to T of G of CT dt is just equal to, you know, G bar. And I'm taking T0 equals 0 and T1 equals T. And then something divided by T. All right, I'm not going to put this in. I might make a mistake. <laughs> uh, um, but um, yeah, you can see it. And basically, you know, taking two values and making the difference. So I, 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 I have this optimal rate of convergence right away. Right? So it turns out in order to be able to present these results, I have to say, I assume a solution to Poisson's equation exists. Again, it's trivial for exponentials. The conditions are just nothing. You know, and I won't get into that, but... Yeah. You can find conditions in the lecture notes, and then nothing. So what I'm going to do is I'm, I know I might not have time to say anything about theory, so instead I'm just going to go and present some applications, and if there's time, say a few words about the theory. Okay. But this is my standing assumption, that um, my probing noise is a solution to a, a, a dynamical system like this, or just complex exponentials. And I'm going to need the solution to Poisson's equation for analysis. I don't need to compute anything. But to get rates of convergence, I'll need, need these guys. OK. So this is going to be fun. So um, yeah, this is, really, this is amazing, actually. So um, by the way, this blue thing is going to be Rich Sutton's mountain car. We'll get back to that uh, next lecture. Um, so. Suppose our objective is to minimize some loss function L of theta, okay? And, but we don't have access to gradient. So there's the kiefer wolfowitz procedure, which is well known in oral circles, which is where you take finite differences, you know? Um, so, so W here is some, uh, typically it's assumed to be IID, as it was in, in the Kiefer and Wolfowitz paper. And, um, and you might stick a gain in here. G is a matrix called a gain. Um, and, um, and, then, and I'm not following my rule. I'm not giving you an ODE and then approximating it. Here's an example where you really can't. So, you know, I mean, at least it wouldn't be, well, you could. It wouldn't be, it would be very contrived. <laughs> so this is an example where you start discrete analysis continuous makes perfect sense. Okay. Um, and so to justify this, it's this Taylor series expansion, right? I mean, for those of you who haven't seen it, you've got a difference of two functions here, and I've just abstracted it a little bit, and you do a Taylor series expansion of both terms, you know, assuming epsilon is small, and all the even terms in the Taylor series expansion cancel out, right? Um, so you get um, you get the first order term, which is the gradient, and you'd get this awful tensor-looking thing involving the uh, the third derivative and something little o of, of epsilon cubed, assuming you have a, a Lipschitz a third derivative. I mean, you know, if you have less smoothness, you'll get a less tight approximation. But right there, you can see what's happening is the gradient pops out. And what you'd like to do then is get rid of the w, and you do that through multiplication by w, right? Because you get a w times a w, 
and then you say, well, you know, and then everything nice things happen, as we'll see. Um, so now I will write down an ODE. <laughs> if I take the expectation of both sides, you know, we all, you all know F bar means expectation. <laughs> Um, so the, so using the standard notion of ODE method, I have a discrete time algorithm and I look at the mean dynamics. That's the standard way people use the term ODE method. And you find that this function F bar is truly the gradient, um, but you know, with a, the matrix G that we introduced and the covariance of the uh, noise W. And again, that's because I have a W times a W. So I end up with a covariance of the noise. Or if it doesn't have zero mean, it's just the, uh, the uh, autocorrelation. Autocor um, autocor um, and then this, all this other stuff just becomes some big O of epsilon squared term um, or better. Okay, all right, so that's it. Now there's something a lot of you don't know about, and that's this beautiful theory of extreme seeking control. Um, I don't think, I'm not doing it today, am I? No. So I'm going to give you a full history of this in the next lecture, comparing this and actor critic methods. Um, but it's completely wild. Um, so this, this started, they claim in 1922. <laughs> I'll, I'll explain that later. But what you do is you, again, you try to get an approximate gradient. And here's the procedure, which I will not justify. It's too hard right now. But you have a physical system, and what you do is you take your current parameter estimate here at theta, okay, and you add on a probing signal, all right, like these mixture of sine waves. So nothing's complex here, a mixture of sine waves is fine. And you give it a name. Then you put that in your physical system, and out comes um, uh, the loss evaluated at that. So this this mapping has filter, like differentiation is an example. And you put your probing thing signal through the same high pass filter and you multiply them together. And that gives you this approximate gradient, you know? And then you multiply that by G and you pass it through this, uh, this machine and you get this ODE. So this, is, this has been studied for 100 years. <laughs> I mean, it only became seriously studied, of course, in the last 50 years, but it's really old. And I don't know why it's not even well known in the controls community. You know, it's a niche sub area of the controls community. But they improve with a low pass filter, which is like Rupert Polyak averaging. So they, they, they sort of have their own Rupert Polyak theory uh, in parallel with the stochastic world. It's, it's quite remarkable. Okay. So um, that's something there's references in the, in the lecture notes. Okay, all right. And then there's this uh, quasi Kiefer Wolfowitz or quasi stochastic gradient descent, um, where you just copy and paste. All right, I've I've done nothing here. You know, all I've done is I've taken the W you see there and I've replaced it by a sine wave or some mixture of sine waves. That's all I've done. So let's try it out, <laughs> okay, and see what happens, All right? So it turns out that, so nothing, ha you know, proposing this algorithm is nothing, but it turns out you can get really crisp rates of conversion. And, and Chavo, I mean, really understand exactly when the, I mean, I mean, you'll see. <laughs> You'll be you'll be surprised. Really, incredibly tight results on the rate of convergence, um, and those are that hasn't been published yet. Um, so it's summarized in the book chapter. All right. Okay. All right. So so next lecture I'm going to give examples in detail, applications to reinforcement learning. Here, I'm really just going to polish up you know, present a, a hint at theory and go to questions, all right? Okay, and so in terms of rates, you know, there's a hint. 
So there's a gain. Oh yeah, I mean, there's a gain there, you know. And the the, the assumption I'm going to be making to get convergence rates, I'm going to assume that AT goes to zero. That's really about it for my uh, my my step size. So I don't have these complicated. I don't have the set of rules you see in stochastic approximation. All right. So what do I do, everybody? Um, I don't. I'm not thrilled with this this uh, choice of step size um, because I'm still forced to look at this uh, i plus g a star being Hurwitz to get the optimal rate. Um, so, and to see that, you only have to look at the non quasi stochastic approximation algorithm. Just look at the thing without noise. Suppose you could actually run that OD. You can't because you don't know F bar. You don't have access to it. Um, even, even without noise, if you want a G over 1 plus T rate of convergence, you need this matrix to be Hurwitz. So maybe we shouldn't use that gain, that step size rule. You know, it, it's just, uh, it's too ugly. And do you see the emergency exit button? So who wants me to talk about the theory? I, I, I guess I'll do it until somebody screams. Okay, I can't hit this, I realize, because it's, it's on the good note, so I can't even use this. <laughs> um, okay, so here's, here's a fun thing. So step one in analysis is to look at this, uh, at this guy here. What I'm doing is I'm, I'm, taking my, uh, I'm taking my algorithm here, my quasi stochastic approximation algorithm, and I'm comparing it to the guy, the mean field guy, but with both of them have a step size. That's what's different than traditional stochastic approximation analysis. I use the same step size for each. I look at the difference between the two and I divide by the step size. So A of T is going to zero. So if this is bounded, I'll get a rate of A of AT. Okay, that's the hope. If Z is bounded, I get my rate of convergence and I get the constants because the rate of convergence, you know, theta T is equal to theta of RT uh, plus uh, Z T A T, you know, and that's going to zero. And if I, so if I know a bound on, on Z T, then I have a really good thing here and bounds on the rate of convergence here is, is much easier. As I'll explain. Well, maybe I won't. I, uh, why this is easy to explain would take another lecture because I'd have to give a lecture on, on, um, on Lyapunov theory for um, nonlinear systems, and I don't have time for that. But, uh, um, but this you can all guess, right? This is much easier to understand um, than than this thing here. All right, it satisfies the differential equation. So the derivative of z to respect to time looks just like what we started with, except linearized. And plus some crazy noise over here. So what uh, this crazy noise is, is a difference between the vector field defining the quasi-stochastic approximation algorithm and the vector field here for the deterministic algorithm. Yeah. All right, so that's noise. And, and this is pretty, isn't it? So I get this additional term here, um, which is the derivative of the log of the gain. <laughs> and this is just a chain rule, it's trivial, but it's, it's so damn tight. Um, under very mild conditions, you get this result, that uh, this RT here, is this plus this, and it's not just little it. You can get a very crisp bound on on how on that error term. All right, so that's step two. All right, you all awake. And then, um, in particular, let's just stick to these special cases. You know, the standard thing you'd look at 
in stochastic approximation is like a constant over one plus t to the rho, then RT turns out to be rho over one plus t. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, rho over one plus t plus this little of a t. And here's where you see the big discrepancies. If rho is less than one, Then, um, well, I should do, do it here. If rho is less than one, then one over one plus t is going to zero super fast <laughs> um, compared to the other term. So it's it's negligible in terms of, at least in first order uh, ideas of rates. Um, but if rho equals one, then rt and at are the same magnitude. And that's, that's the reason you get this, uh, this bigger matrix in the case of uh, using or equals one. Okay, so it really, hel really helps to explain things. All right, and then, all right, you still awake? What time is it? Then you make a change of variables. I'll, I'll explain what this crazy thing is in a moment. It's basically this noise. It's it, what's well, the integral of a noise. I'll, I'll define it actually, but uh, let's forget it for now. Um, basically, what I want to do is I, I want to, my goal is to take this and bring it to the other side. And doing that, I get some approximations, but they're not too bad. And so with this change of variables, yt also satisfies an ODE. And this now is zero mean. And this is a constant. All right. And then this is just an additive term, big deal. I don't need to emphasize that. Okay, all right. So this is this is just from here to here is again a bit of algebra. Once I've defined this, you know, which I don't have to a definition. But the big thing is that we can get a rate of convergence on this really easily. We know with a rate that y t is basically a constant, and therefore we've identified z t. So ZT is just equal to the thing I haven't defined plus a constant. Okay, and and we can sharpen this a lot. You know, we won't have time today, but we can discuss it later. Okay. Yeah. So the amazing conclusion is is that we have this result that. Uh, the parameter S of theta t is theta star, um, you know, plus is step size rule times this. Um, and here I can finally give you the definitions. So, um, so this weird thing here, it's an integral of this zero mean process. All right, because we know this, we know this is bounded. And it's, we're assuming, this is an assumption, that this Poisson's equation solution exists. But, but in the, you'll see in the lecture notes, it's valid under very minor, minor conditions. So this is just a, a sinusoidal signal, basically. I mean, a periodic signal, or almost periodic signal. And then there's a constant. So we get this really thing. And, I can, and, and again, we'll discuss it later. You can sharpen this quite a bit. Um, and so uh, this bias, because we're doing quasi, uh, we're doing, you know, um, kiefer wolfowitz stuff, but it's of order epsilon squared or something. And to your point, Shaba, about do we want to compute things exactly, we don't, you know. So I wouldn't mind a constant step size. So I'm, I'm looking at vanishing step size to get some really tight uh, understanding. In practice, I might use a very small constant step size. Maybe not. You know, we'll, we'll discuss that as well. Um, so the bias, I don't think, is a big issue. Um, now, here's a fun fact. Anybody out there, like Eric, you must be out there. I don't know, Eric Moline. Um, Many people out there are saying, yeah, just do Rupert Polyak averaging. So basically, you take the output of the algorithm with rho less than one, say rho equals a half, and then you just average it. That's the definition of Polyak 
uh, rupert averaging well guess what it fails <laughs> um it fails because of this damn thing here it works if and only if this strange y bar thing is zero and i don't know what the hell this thing is <laughs> I can give you cases where it's zero, but in general, it's not. It's a very non-local thing. Yeah, so um, so sorry, you can't use Rupert. Um, I don't think it's gonna work for uh, quasi-gradient descent in general. Um, so uh, it's that hat there that makes it non-local. You know, the F hat means it depends on the behavior of the system far from the equilibrium. So that's that's what happens. So that's fun. So this is this is a few weeks old in a way, um, and a month old. I'm really excited about it. Um, so again, um, yeah, I've got a minute. So some refinements and warnings. Now, global. One, I haven't given you conditions for convergence for any of this theory to work. Again, you can find it in the book chapter. Lipschitz continuity of F is really critical in the analysis and all. Um, and for example, if you look at this algorithm, which I used to love, it has almost the same F bar um, as, uh, as the other algorithm I presented, if, if uh, C has zero mean. They're like a mixture of, of sinusoids. You know, zero temporal mean. Um, but L is going to typically be strongly convex. So in that case, L is not going to be globally Lipschitz continuous. And so the theory falls apart. None of what I said is true. You might be able to get some local theory, but I can't, you know, I, I'm not going to try. Now, at first I didn't realize that, and I did experiments. This is mountain car, by the way. I'll, I'll explain it next lecture. I, I, I compared this algorithm with, you know, with the sort of Kiefer-Wolfowitz equivalent, where you put an IED noise with the same variance in quotes. And with the stochastic algorithm, so I did a thousand independent trials. You got this incredibly just noise. Every run looked different. Um, while with the quasi-algorithm, it was consistently converging close to the minimum after only 5,000 samples because uh, I was doing an Euler scheme sampling every second. <laughs> um, and there's a lack of, it doesn't always converge to the same thing, but it converges to the valley. The, the objective function is flat. This light blue thing is the objective function. And so after 5,000 samples, it's dead on <laughs> giving you something right in that tiny region where it's almost optimal. So it's just, I'm very excited about how well, this performs in some experiments I've done. Um, okay, so conclusions. Don't introduce volatility if you don't have to. Um, uh, what's the best way to do translation if I asked at the beginning of the lecture? I think people in Quasi Monte Carlo would love to help, so why not let them? Also, people in numerical analyst, analysis looking at differential equations, we should bring them in, you know, <laughs> uh, more the merrier. Um, Applications to constrained optimizations is something we're working on with friends at NRL in particular. Um, and in particular, what I just talked about in the last lecture, you know, they have a constrained optimization problem there. Um, and applications to RL is the next, uh, next thing. Now, what's really funny is that an interest in Kiefer Wolfowitz was reborn two years ago um, at, the, at the 2018 program. Um, when Paniotis, uh, with Greek last name, and Chaba, don't ask me to pronounce your last name either, um, grabbed Aditya and I, and we set to work trying to get a better understanding of rate of convergence to Kiefer Wolfowitz. Um, so uh, it was really, it was really cool. I mean, that program was just life changing. And I, thank you, Simon. So that was just one thing. It was, it was awesome talking to Paniotis. But I give up. I mean, the quasi theory is so damn simple. I want to dive into that, and I'm going to let somebody else uh, extend the theory for stochastic algorithms. Um, that's what I'm saying here. Uh, some of the ideas that I laid out to you, I bet could help to improve the rate theory for 
stochastic algorithms, but again, I'm going to leave that to somebody else. Yeah, that's it. Questions? Cool. Uh, thank you. Uh, so Sharon was yeah, asking about, yeah, yeah. Uh, about, yeah, Sharon, uh, what's funny, was asking about this averaging, exactly this slide. Yeah. Whether this is something like pale averaging that you're talking about here. Well, no, well, oh yeah, this is, this is polyac Rupert, Rupert polyac averaging. So Rupert polyac averaging, um, the way it's defined is you, you take a very high gain algorithm, you know, so they had more restrictive consumptions on row, is one example. Um, so, so the the high gain, so again, the row is, is right there, means that this is so. If row is small, means high gain. You're pushing up eighty. Eight yeah. Step size is big. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm taking something small, raising it to the row power, and making it bigger. Yeah, okay. yeah, and so and so that that means that means high volatility. Okay, and so Rupert Polyak proved that if for stochastic algorithms, that if you just do that, say okay, I'll have high volatility, but I'll average at the end, you get the optimal not you get the optimal rate of convergence and the optimal constants in the rate. It's absolutely mind-boggling. Um, in practice, it doesn't work very well often because the rate of convergence of CLT is sometimes very slow. Uh, I think there are ways to fix that. So, but in practice, it hasn't been very popular because of that. But for the deterministic case, it actually fails because of this residual constant. Um, it's mm -hmm. because our objective is strong, uh, stronger. They're trying to get the CLT in the usual sense. I'm trying to get a one over T convergence rate. And so that's that's the reason it fails. Yeah, um, yeah I guess Sharan's uh, point was actually that uh, maybe there's something called tail averaging where you put higher weights on mm. uh, iterate the more recent. That, um, that, that's 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 what I was going to say. In fact, if you look at my lecture notes, that's all I say. I the only <laughs> reason I, I I presented this was so it'd be easy to write it down. So, so theoretically, this has the same variance as tail averaging, but in practice, no way. Tail averaging kicks ass. <laughs> you know, it, it just, it's amazing how much better it is. And the experiments I've done, it's all tail averaging. So I take the last 20%, sorry, or something. Yeah. Uh -huh. So Roshan had a question on uh, Discord that I were trying to convey. Uh, I think it was it mostly relates to the previous lecture. Um, so the question was whether the ODE approach to stochastic approximation can also recover the ideas from online learning and online optimization like mirror descent, regularizers, whatnot. Oh. It's a bit open-ended. Um, whether I, I guess the elaboration is whether you know, these ideas are able to, the continuous time and that is able to recover the performance guarantees that usually you get for the online, from the online learning uh, literature. Um, I think that was what I was also poking at previously. Yeah, I don't know. Um, but the thing is that here, you know, a lot of what I'm doing here is showing that the stochastic algorithm and the deterministic algorithm couple so fast that it's not even random. And um, uh. yeah, um, and, but only because I designed the deterministic algorithm carefully. You know, like I mentioned, if I use the wrong gain, it's not true. So if I uh, design my non-quasi pure mean derivative thing properly, I automatically get a incredibly fast rate of convergence. And I wish I had time, well, maybe I, I mean, you've got your theta star, right? And then I, I'm gonna draw an epsilon ball around that, some, or delta, whatever. And I have an initial condition here, theta zero, all right? And I've got my deterministic guy, my, my theta dot equals f bar 
of theta, and I put bars on that just to, oh, no, I need my game. Now, there's two properties. There's one, how long did it reach the bowl? Well, what's cool is that this is just a time change of the original ODE. So the theory gives you, gives you answers. You know, so we can get bounds on the time to reach this ball using the Lyapunov theory, right? And then within the ball, we have pristine rate results, <laughs> rate bounds, pristine. I'm just excited, everyone. I'm not bragging. Because it's, it's so, you know how it is, when something's very new, you, you smile a lot. So I'm not, this is not arrogance, it's happiness. Um, so the word pristine sounds totally arrogant, pretentious. But I, I, but it's true that you'll see we, the, the results I've given to you, I haven't given you the details. You get really, really nice results in, in this region of attraction for the deterministic guy, not for the stochastic guy, you know. So the Lyapunov theory tells you this is invariant for this invariant, this, this ball. Um, this is an invariant set. So for the, for the theta bar set, you can never leave it. Uh, and, and the fact that you can never leave it is how you get such uh, tight bounds. So to answer your question, I think that you can get a lot of success by first looking at the idealization ODE, and then once you understand that well enough, go to the uh, stochastic or whatever, you know, the, the noisy version. Yeah. So there's no way to prove it's absorbing for the original thing. It's for this uh, deterministic guy. That, that's right. sort of an answer. <laughs> Uh, I was also wondering about whether there is any connection to, I remember that there was a time in the 90s where we, people were trying to work with conditions for stochastic approximation that were based on deterministic analysis. Like I think Dayan or Benyam or... Oh, sure. I mean, that's the thing. But they, but they were, I mean, Benyam, how do you pronounce his name? Are we, but I, but I, anyway, um, but his, he was mainly extending the theory, just beautiful ways of conceptualizing really difficult problems, you know, where F is not, not Lipschitz, not smooth, not anything. Um, that was, and, and some really nice dynamical systems theory to, he has, he has great lecture notes on that. Um, and Diane on, I don't know. The Diane reference, I know Diane, but I don't know what you're referring to. Um, it's yeah. been a while. I've looked at this literature, so off the top of my head, but I, I see that there is something called deterministic analysis of stochastic approximation algorithms. I, I can dig up the the reference later. Yeah. Uh, I, I remember that, like they were talking about uh, sufficient conditions for the noise sequence to hold, which is not noise anymore, but this deterministic perturbation. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah, that, that's and that, that's a yeah, yeah, yeah. So oh, that's right. Absolutely. So um, um, yeah. But but I, I yeah, that's right. Which is really a good way to go. Is is instead of assuming it's ID or Mar or Martingale, yeah. I put conditions on the noise. Um, but all all the theory I'm aware of is geared towards making sure it's uh, acceptable when you go to a uh, IID setting or whatever. And mm -hmm. I'm going the other route. I, I don't want it to be acceptable because I'm trying to get this one over T rate of convergence. Yeah, yeah, I, I see that. But uh, so I think my goals are different, that's all. Um, yeah. I should have said that the, the, the prior work I'm aware of is in finance. I, I forgot to mention that. Um, not in rates of convergence, but I'm using um, like sine waves. Uh, you can again. You can find it in the references. Um, but, yeah. 
is there so so you also mentioned this uh so th this is uh, the skifer wolf of it uh it's like the two point approximation of the gradient oh, yeah. bsa and then you were talking about the one point approximation and yeah. if you do the two point approximation you can do the taylor expansion to a higher degree and I think that maybe one crucial fact here is that you have the same noise plugged in into two places yeah. that are to cancel each other, yeah. um, or same perturbation in this case, um, which uh, is going to be challenging in reinforcement learning, right? Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, good point. So, the, so that's oh right. So, I mean, if you have yeah. a simulator, sure. Like it's like a common random number generator. Yeah, yeah. Right? That's a good point. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll I'll give an example next hour where it's not a big deal, you know. But you're right; in general, it would be a big deal. Um, and, and, and so, and would, is it, so would be is not, it, yeah. This is one of the big reasons you can get the faster rate because you can reuse the same perturbation <laughs> twice and make two measurements at least. Oh no! No, well, the theory is so? totally but, general. Oh, no, it's the Lipschitz continuity, because my the, the theorem I gave is nothing to do with anything. It's totally general. It doesn't require kiefer wolfowitz or anything. This oh, is okay, any... okay, okay. I, I yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah, sorry if I didn't make that clear. Oh, no, so I, this was just an example. Um, but, but, oh. but, but this, but, oh, I, I'm sorry, I should have made that clearer. I didn't realize that. Now, this entire theory part was for anything. Um, this theorem okay. here, this theorem here is for anything. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the assumptions are really mild. Um, okay, cool. Yeah. I need a Lyapunov function or something to make sure I get in a region of attraction. And I need a linearization. That's really crucial. You know, I, I need smoothness at theta star. Mm -hmm. Okay. Everyone left? Yeah. Oh, no, no. All right, good. <laughs> So the next lecture will be lighter, I think. It'll be a lot of history, but it'll be fun history. And some examples and how to apply these ideas to um, to the mountain car. You know, just is a, it's a, it's a fun last lecture. All right, uh, so let's take a quick break and, and we come back in 20 minutes then. <laughs>